Hello and welcome back to Module 9, second part of Exchange Online Hybrid. And this will be um, much more demo intensive, so we will, as we discussed in the last module, walk you through the cut over, the staged migration, as well as the hybrid scenarios, how to set those up. And I will hand it over to uh, Jinka to start off, hey. to continue where we left it off. <laughs> Thank you. So last time we were talking about uh, the entire piece for um, your planning and which are the different techniques, what are the different pieces that you want to be looking at. And uh, from your, we're going to get into more of the different uh, migration techniques themselves, uh, how to use the tools, what are the caveats in different migration techniques to build a bigger picture. And then we'll try to summarize each of these migration techniques for you. Uh, to get a better understanding as to you know when when are you going to use them and uh, uh, how is it going to work for your customer at the end of the day. So let me take you to uh, the presentation for a second. All right. So on your screens right now, uh, you'll be seeing simple migrations. And uh, the first one there that we're going to target is IMAP, uh, IMAP cutover migrations, basically. So when you talk about IMAP, uh, this could be from any email system. The idea here is to capture email and get it into the Exchange Online piece. Uh, the idle places that I've seen or the places that I've seen this being used or recommended being used is in uh, POP um, and IMAP providers. If you have Exchange and you can have RPC or HCP uh, access, MAPI access to it, uh, the migration technique would be a, not, not IMAP, but an Exchange migration piece, which we'll talk about. So going from POP and IMAP providers, third-party providers, to Office 365, a couple of different pieces there. And uh, all that you need here is uh, your IMAP ports to be open over TCP. So this is, this is important, uh, um, just a recommendation. It's, it's really good to have your port numbers at your fingertips um, for, for your discussions with your customers, uh, for deployments, for all of these pieces. Second, you need to have a CSV file with a list of all these POP3 users or these users mm -hmm. that you want to migrate from. Um, and have that ready. There's a CSV file format that you can get uh, from the Office 365 help uh, community, or um, we'll, we'll be sharing it as part of the content. So you have uh, the user email addresses, usernames, their passwords. Uh, because what this tool is going to do is literally going to log in into the user's uh, account and extract the emails from there. Um, and you can migrate about uh, 50,000 um, at, at a time in terms of the CSV file. Uh, but the max uh, size of email that you're going to be able to extract here is about 10 meg. Uh, that shouldn't be much of a concern because most of the providers that provide POP and IMAP limit their users at a 10 meg um, send receive size, so you should be good around that piece. So the rule of thumb to remember or the point to remember here is when you're doing IMAP migrations, it's going to just migrate email. There's not going to be anything else, so it's going to take a bulk of email, pull it, and put it into the Exchange Online system. That's all it's going to do. If you have calendars, contacts, all of that, that, that's just not going to be migrated using IMAP. And uh, the number of items that you can migrate. So it's difficult to uh, kind of count the number of items that a user would have. Uh, ideally, what you're going to be looking at is, one, what is the size of that mailbox, and try to estimate probably based on the average size of emails that that user has, how many items would be there in that mailbox. Right? That's, that's the best way to do it. Um, not foolproof, but that's the best way. 
And second is uh, when you run the batch file for IMAP migration, uh, the reactive way of knowing that probably the, probably the user's mailbox is beyond that limit is you'll the migration uh, for that user will fail. It'll give you an error message, and you'll just know. So that's when you'll go back and uh, kind of empty out a bit of email from that mailbox, probably download it to a PSC or something, and then run IMAP my mail migration again. All right. Uh, you can specify folders in an IMAP migration uh, to just extract uh, email from specific folders. That's possible. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, the after my, uh, when you're migrating, you're going to hit the 35 uh, meg limit there as well. So from there, when you go into the actual steps to migrate, so you have uh, your users that you're going to create in Office 365, uh, it's going to be a manual creation. Remember, remember you're not using DirSync for IMAP and uh, cutover migrations. So you create the users, you put in all the user IDs and passwords for the pop provider into a CSV file, upload that CSV file into the migration tool, and uh, you have uh, your uh, migration started. It's a batch that will run. Uh, that'll do incremental syncs with the existing provider until you hit complete on the migration. So here's what. Um, first, what's going to happen is going to take the entire chunk of data, synchronize it. From there, every 24 hours, it'll look for new emails or delta changes in that mailbox and pull those over as well. It'll do that until you say you hit a complete button on the batch. Uh, now, before you hit the complete button, you want to move the MX record to Exchange Online to ensure that you have all the email there. All right, uh, once that's done, you basically clean up uh, your POP2 provider, it's gone, and the users are using Exchange Online, you're good to go. The sec second portion is you're using cutover migration for, from an Exchange server to Exchange Online. So during this, like we discussed, a couple of pointers to have a look at uh, as to what you should be look, seeing, what to do, when to do, uh, which migration technique to use when. So if you're doing cutover migration, uh, you're going to have about uh, 1,000 users at a time that are going to be, if, that's the cap that you can migrate with cutover. Uh, so you, again, there's no dursing that you're deploying your, uh, there's RPC over HTTP or Outlook uh, synchronization that needs to be there in place. And uh, you need to have that in place. I'll show you how to test that in, in demo shortly. So you just have that in place and uh, connect to the servers, extract the data. So this is going to deploy uh, or it's going to extract everything right from uh, mail, uh, calendars, contacts, tasks, and going to provision or import it into the Exchange Online system. Now, passwords is something that's going to be new. You're going to have to share passwords with uh, your users. right? So at this point, I'll kind of pause on PPTs. Uh, let me get my demo system up while you know, I'll I'll ask Stefan to just summarize it for you a little bit <coughs> and help you re uh, get aligned with the planning portions and the migration technique. Yeah, so we talked about the IMAP portion, right? IMAP migration, which is fairly straightforward, right? You have your CSV file, go into Excel, create this with the usernames, the passwords to get access to the individual email accounts, and then it's going to be transferred over from your POP or IMAP, POP3 or IMAP map accounts. Um, there's some limitations you have to be careful about, um, so watch out for those and be prepared uh, to respond to that. For instance, in an exam, this might be trick questions coming here and there. 50,000 rows is a maximum in, in the CSV file, for instance, and also the 10 megabyte file size that we have there, the limitation there. Um, beyond that, um, 
cutover migration is something um, that we will now demo in the demo mate. So mm -hmm. we can switch back. Um, All right. So let's uh, look at the demonstration now. Uh, the assumption here is our Exchange server is, but of course, up running. It's good. I'm using the Exchange 2010 box uh, to the cutter over here, but it could be Exchange 2003, 2007, doesn't matter. Uh, you can use the same methodology. There's no difference here. Uh, only how you set up the Outlook Anywhere is going to change. So I'm going to use Exchange 2010. I'm um, going to click on Enable Outlook Anywhere uh, in the Client Access settings in Server Configuration and uh, give the external host name. I'm going to use basic authentication and click Finish. Now your uh, Outlook Anywhere is enabled. Remember, um, you're making an IIS change at the back end here to enable Outlook Anywhere. So it's suggested to restart uh, IIS. I'm going to go ahead and restart a couple of services here. Once that's done, uh, the next piece is to actually test if Outlook Anywhere is working and if you're able to access it over the internet. So here's a great tool that you can use. It's testexchangeconnectivity.com. I'm sure a lot of you have already used this. So this is a web-based internet tool. So you come into the tool, you basically select which test you want to run. So at this point, I, don't, I want to uh, talk about uh, or I want to test Outlook anywhere, or RPC over HTTP, right? So I'm going to select that piece and click Next. I'm going to enter my email address, uh, user ID, password, all those nice things. I'm going to manually configure the service settings so I'm able to connect. Okay, you can also use Auto Discover uh, if you have that published on the internet uh, as a service record or as a CDM record. That's going to work as well. And I'm going to select basic because I set the authentication to basic, agree to the terms and conditions. Now this verification piece uh, where you're looking at uh, the alphanumerics and entering them could be a little tricky. A couple of times if you're using, you should understand uh, or get a hands-on hunt to that. I, I have until late, so let me try to perform test. All right, that's perfect. So the test performs, uh, basically what the tool does is it uh, tries to connect to the exchange on-premise for an RPC connection. It simulates an RPC or HTTP connection and uh, provides you test results. So for me, I'm all clear. It's green. If you have any errors, remember, expand on these, go to the error piece, and that will give you a link as to how you can actually resolve or the probable cause of that error message. So once that's done, uh, you go back to your Exchange server, uh, check for mailbox permissions. Now, when you're doing mailbox migration, the user ID that you're going to use to connect to with RPC or HTTP from the Exchange migration tool needs to have uh, full access on the mailboxes, okay? So what I'm doing here is um, I'm checking for rights. Uh, full access is there for the administrator, perfect. Uh, I'm good to go here. And I'm gonna extend rights here to receive as, as well because I need that too. And from there, I can uh, go into my Exchange system online or the Microsoft Online portal, sign in, go into domains and so at this point um, I'm, I'm kind of starting from the base so I don't really have the online system set up for me. So I'm going to add the domain to it, verify the domain. Uh, so this is my publicly routable domain that I'm adding and I'm going to create the text records in my public DNS. It's verified so I'm going to just assume that's done and move to next. Now, this is called domain intent that we're looking at right here. So for what services is this particular public domain going to be used in the online services? So at this point, I'm just going to use it for Exchange and Link. Fulvio later would be using it for SharePoint as well. All right, uh, and I can configure DNS as well uh, in 
for more additional configurations. So I'm good with uh, my domain that's verified active. The next piece is to ensure that uh, what is the status of mailboxes, I'm clean on this side. So I'm going to go ahead with uh, starting the email migration. So I'm in the Exchange Management Console on the Microsoft Online Portal. I'm going to go into an in email migration, click on new, new uh, migration. So that's going to run a batch or create a batch for me, basically. Um, now, here you'll see a couple of options. You have Exchange 2007 and later, or that's where you have Auto Discover enable, or you have Exchange 2003 and later versions where you want to manually specify connection settings and migrate. And third is the IMAP migration that we talked about. So right now we're going to have a look at uh, Exchange 2007 migration techniques. So let me go click next. All right, and it seems like my demo system just went crash. So give me a second, let me bring that back up. Just a moment there. So at this point where we are is we're fairly ready to run the migration uh, for um, the cutover piece from an exchange on-prem to exchange online. So just to revise the steps that we've done is one, we've ensured that RPC or HTTP is enabled on the on-premises system. Secondly, we've ensured that the domain is added in the online portal. It's verified, it's ready to take users in. The assumption here is I've already set the UPN name on the on-premises on Active Directory to match the um, public writable domain or the SMTP domain uh, that I'm going to be using. So that's something that we talked about in Fulvio session yesterday in Active Directory uh, infrastructure um, readiness. So that's, that's already done. All right, so my demo environment's back. I'm going to take you back there, uh, share my screen. Now, when we're looking at uh, the email migration tool, with the minute I click Next, I enter the user ID. Now, this is a user ID, remember, that has full access and receive as permissions on the on-premise uh, mailboxes, right? That's very important, or you're going to run the batch, and it's just going to fail out on you after a couple of hours, which is frustrating. So I'm going to enter the remaining credentials, and you can select uh, the number of mailboxes that you want to migrate simultaneously at a time. Now, this is related to two things. One, what is the amount of load that the on-premise system can take to, at a time to uh, extract or work with the mailboxes because the additional load of syncing data to the online system is going to be there. And second is what is the bandwidth? How much data simultaneously can you actually afford to extract into the system? So I'm going to just leave it as three default, then click Next. At this point, just like we did test exchange connectivity, RPC connection, the system is going to try to connect to the on-premise uh, system over RPC. If this fails, that means there's some uh, misconfiguration or firewall blocked with uh, the on-premise system. But we've already tested that's clean for me, so I'm good to go. Um, it will give you a quick summary of uh, what's there. You can send a report to an email address. Now, this piece is important. Uh, you can change the email address as required. Uh, the actual report as to which, what failed, why it failed is going to be in this report. So you, you want to make sure that you have a handle on that one. All right, uh, so my summary is good. I'm going to click Run. Now, you see a script starts running on your screens right now. It's saying creating recipients from Exchange One. So it's going to create the users and start the mi data migration right after. Uh, what's happening here is uh, the script is running until all of it is completed. And uh, you can see summary of it, what's really happening, how many items are getting migrated, start times, end times. So it's a good monitoring tool for migration to so start it and kind of leave it, let it run. Uh, once uh, that piece is done, it's going to be at this particular screen that I've staged here for you guys. 
Uh, it could be a couple of hours or even a day, depending on the amount of data size that you're running in a cutover. So once it's done, you ideally want to have no errors in place. That means all your mailboxes got migrated, or else you're going to have to rerun this migration tool. Now, once it's done, uh, you don't want to just come in and instinctly, instinctively click on complete migration, right? So until this batch file is showing up in this particular situation here, it's con going to do 24 incremental syncs with the on-premises mailbox every 24 hours. So until you've switched the MX record to the online system, you don't want to click complete, right? Disclaimer, remember, if you click complete, no more incremental syncs. So you're going to probably have a little bit of uh, emails that are going to left, be left behind that got received after the initial <coughs> synchronization was complete with this script. All right, uh, so that's done. I'm ready to move the MX record. So I switch the MX record, click Complete Migration. And if I come into my Microsoft Online portal, check the domain, yeah, I'm, I'm good. It's partially redelegated, uh, and everything is in place for me. What I need to do, though, is uh, create MX, uh, create for MX record creation or movement, uh, I can refer to the DNS settings in, in this particular section. We've gone through it before, just for your reference again. So this is going to allow me to write emails to the cloud and also have a CNAME record for auto-discover for Outlook automatic configuration. All right, uh, so assuming I've completed uh, the MX record changes, I come in here, click on complete, it'll give me an error message or a warning rather, which says, are you sure you want to complete uh, uh, the cutover migration? I'll say yes. And the script will basically complete and move out. I can uh, view the uh, migration report. It and it takes me to a browser, click on it, and I'll get a file that I can see. So I'm going to open a notepad. Uh, it shows you in CSV format, basically. I'm reading it in notepad. You can open it in Excel as well. Uh, you have uh, the email addresses that were migrated, the type of object, uh, password uh, that was set, and uh, the status, so if it was completed, not, failed, uh, item skip, this kind of information is there. Right, so that's uh, the migration for cutover and simple migration. I'm going to go back to exchange, assign licenses here, and users are good to use their systems from this point. So we've done with cutover migration basically, and um, my demo is complete. I can move back to my slide deck just to you know kind of give us a quick summary now if you're referring to your slide deck and you know let me just toggle around a little bit uh, with these as to what the limitations are and what you should be looking in when you're planning this particular deployment so when you're doing a cut over migration uh, a couple of limitations that you want to be planned for is your secure your DLs, oh, let me resume slideshow. All right, so you're going to have uh, your security groups, uh, dynamic distribution lists. Uh, the, these pieces you're going to have to create manually if you're doing cutover migrations. Um, all your mail mailboxes are really going to go out to the to. Uh, the online services. Also, if you're running Exchange 2010, dumpster data or a legacy system, dumpster data is not migrated to the cloud. Um, and and this, this limitation could seem a little hard, but we don't migrate any email greater than 35 meg to the cloud service using our tools. All right. Uh, and if your customer is looking at kind of controlling this migration process, that's not possible. All data that's there in the mailbox at that point in time will just be taken and uploaded. So you can't really do full day exclusions or given a time range to do this kind of migration. If they want to do that, they'll have to manually extract the data or remove the data from the mailbox before the migration actually happens. 
Now, if you have uh, UM enabled mailboxes, uh, it's going to error out, so you're going to have to plan for that. A bit piece that we talked about yesterday in unified mm -hmm. messaging planning. So you're going to have to manage these users a little differently and uh, first take down unified messaging for them on-premise, bring them on the cloud, and re-enable them for unified messaging. All right, so that's uh, the whole piece. Uh, there's going to be a new profile uh, that you're going to have to create for these users. So this is, again, an important point in planning and deployment. Uh, with cutover migration, you it's a new profile. Your OST is going to synchronize from start. All right. A couple of references as to what's going to migrate, what's not going to migrate here. Uh, so I'm going to leave this for your reading. Just a disclaimer, server-side rules are not migrated. Even though it says uh, mail items migrated rules, uh, server-side rules are not migrated. Only client-side rules would get migrated because they're part of the mailbox. All right, uh, calendar items, all good. OK, so we're good with uh, kind of migration. That's pretty much done. I'm going to move it back to Stefan uh, to, you know, Kind I'll of, give you a uh, quick, quick walkthrough, um, and you ha have this also on the slide, mm -hmm. while um, Jinka is setting up the stage migration uh, demo. So um, as, as a quick recap, so we go out, we make sure enable Outlook Anywhere, meaning RPC or HTTP is working properly. We set up the mailbox my permissions, you can access those, and then we uh, go out, set the DNS, the DNS properly, we provision all the mailboxes, contacts, DLs, and then we start initiate the, the synchronization, which will happen in batches. And then we will have to continue keeping that migration tool up and running. So incremental syncs will happen only after you change the MX record. You can hit the complete button. Right? This was one of the things that Jinky was very insistent on. So keep that in mind. If you hit complete before, those the on premises uh, email will still. Be, um, continuing to go in and out, and, but it will be out of sync with what's being migrated. So there might be a delta, and you don't want that. So wait until the max record is changed, and then you complete the migration on that point. You do the final cleanup steps, and you're good to go. Uh, so relatively straightforward compared to the stage migration, which we will do next. But um, I think uh, the, the key points and the limitations we pointed out that you have to be aware of um, when you go through those exam questions. So, Jinkyo, are we getting uh, close? Yep, uh, we're are getting you ready close. For the stage so, mm -hmm. uh, so my demo is uh, loading. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to talk about stage migration and right. uh, what's required, what's not required uh, when doing the stage migration process. So, uh, when uh, you're talking about stage migration, what we're seeing is a little bit of a twist from cutover. So you're first deploying uh, direct resynchronization into the environment. And uh, from there, uh, your direct resync is going to bring all the users from on-premise into the online system. So that's, uh, that's step one. The minute, like I was saying earlier, the minute you put in direct resynchronization into uh, the system, your migration tool that we just saw that we used to migrate using Cutover is automatically going to consider that you have uh, to go that you're going in for stage migration. So it's not even going to offer you the Cutover migration steps that we just did. It's going to ask you for a CSV file uh, rather than it connecting to the on-premise system and picking up. Uh, the user's uh, configuration and migrating it for you. So it's going to consider you, the user file in the CSV that you're going to mention. It's only going to target those users, extract the data for them only. So that's going to be a different that I was talking about. And uh, that's how it's going to progress with your actual stage migration. So let me share uh, my screens. Let me show you the presentation a bit for a minute. And uh, let's uh, talk a bit about what are the requirements that you need to have. 
So just like Cutover, I uh, remember we're using the same technique to connect to the on-premises system. So you need to have Outlook Anywhere in place, working. You could, the text exchange connectivity tool is the place that you want to look at. Now, when you're doing this migration, uh, one piece that I missed actually pointing out to you guys is to have a public certificate on the Exchange server that you're migrating from. Um, so, and that Exchange certificate needs to have SMTP IAS assigned to it as the services. Now, why is this important? Um, emails work fine even if you don't have uh, a SSL certificate on, that s on an Exchange server. But for migration, you need that. Because when the online system is going to try to connect to the on-premises server, it's going to build an SSL connection, TLS connection, and needs to authenticate or validate the on-premise exchange service certificate. It's not going to be able to do that if you have a self-signed certificate or you have a uh, locally generated certificate uh, because the provider is uh, not authenticated f or is not authoritative for uh, the online system. So you need to have a public certificate so that the authority uh, providing it is known to the online system, which is only possible with public certs. So that's the reason why. Uh, so there'll be a good question from customers there is, so what you're telling me is I need to purchase a certificate just to migrate to the cloud? I'm not going to do that, right? So that, that's a huge blocker mm -hmm. for them because they need to spend uh, because just because we need to validate the certificate. So if you're doing stage migration, it's going to be within about 30 days, ideally. Uh, like I was explaining yesterday, there are SS certificate providers in the market today that are providing certificates for 30-day trials. You don't need to pay anything. You just get the certificate, complete the migration process, and you're good. Again, um, not the best practice way, but that's a possibility that you can use as, as uh, a way because you just need to do that migration. That's as much. Okay, and again, a one migration batch for uh, the stage migration can have a maximum of 1,000 users again. Uh, that's a cap from our side that you need to follow. Right, uh, so from a coexistence standpoint, what you're going to have uh, is addressless synchronization, and you're going to have uh, the email flowing. That's, that's as much as you're going to have. So plan well as to which users need to share free, free busy information, where you need to have delegated rights to mailboxes, group them together and migrate them together to the cloud, or leave them on-premises together so that you can continue to have uh, the delegation, free busy information being shared. So going back to the example that Stefan and I were discussing earlier with you, where Stefan owns a company and he's the CEO, but he needs his assistant <coughs> to have access to his mailbox, being able to see his calendar information as well. So that's, that's the piece uh, from reconnecting it with the planning and w when you're actually deploying. Uh, the Office 365 using a migration technique. Let me have a quick uh, cup of water here. All right. So um, going back to the passwords, again, when you're doing stage migration, you, the passwords are going to be different for on-premises and online. Uh, you can deploy, I'm saying you can deploy SSO in this situation if the customer wants uh, to have a single sign-on uh, process that's possible. Right, uh, so basically you go back to the same tool that we were talking about. Uh, you put in uh, or you check the appropriate option. In this case, I'm using Exchange 2010 again at the back end to migrate. So I'm going to select Exchange 2007 uh, or later versions with auto discover. Put in the user ID password. Uh, select the number of uh, mailboxes that will be migrated simultaneously. Now remember, uh, the total batch that you're giving in the CSV file and the simultaneous concurrent migration sessions is, is two different things. So I plan accordingly for that as well. So you have your CSV. I have an example of that on your screens right now. So you 
take that CSV or Notepad, import it into uh, the migration tool. So you notice this additional step that you have here uh, that, that's coming, right? So this was not there in Kodo where it directly just tests the connection and starts the uh, entire process for you. So you can again send the report to an administrator. It's a summary. And uh, basically, the migration starts at this point. So you have uh, directory synchronization, and then your mi mailbox migration starting. And personally, I like this slide, just diverting a little bit, uh, which shows users literally getting migrated to the cloud. So, all right. So once that's done, uh, users migrated to the cloud. Uh, you have a MEU that's or mail enabled object that you're going to have on premise that's going to repoint the users to the cloud services right uh, that's done your mailbox is migrated you can view the report once again and you're good to go just so just summarizing your thousand users is the limit per batch you're going to use a csv file uh, and you can Ex, uh, exception you can provide is if you want the passwords to be reset automatically or not within the CSV file itself. So that's uh, your stage migrations. Again, a couple of limitations on your screens right now. Pretty much the same that we have with a cutover migration. All right, so I'm going to go through this real quick and leave them for your reference. So you just to summarize again, I'm going to pass it back to Stefan, and he'll walk you through these steps uh, just to help summarize what's, <coughs> what's happening there. So yeah, a stage migration, a little bit more involved. You use the same tool again. You have to set up the directory sync first. Make sure you have proper mailbox permissions set up. You go into Excel or Notepad and make sure you have prepare the um, CSV file with the user accounts, with the mailboxes, with the usernames and passwords. Then you go in, um, edit the DNS record, make sure that you have that properly set, the remote server details. Then you go ahead and start upgrading mailboxes, the MEUs, the mail enabled um, units. And then you go out and add the target address to an on prem mailbox. It starts with a data sync. Again, you have to think about simple coexistence at that point, right? keeping things intact like delegation. And keep that data sync going. Batches, users are being migrated. And keep that all going until you change the Amex record. Only after the Amex record has been changed, then you can complete the migration. Hit the complete button and start with the clean up action. <clears throat> so, all in all, again, state, state migration, you will do have to do this with large organizations. You have to do it when you are, um, from an identity perspective, keeping your um, AD on premises, so you don't go into a full cloud identity. That's when cut over um, migration won't work for you. You have to do stage migration. And, uh, from a time perspective, if it's something that takes you longer than just uh, the weekend, again, stage migration is something you want to be looking at as an option. So now we're going to do, going back to our Jinkio, you know, we're taking you through the live stage demo. Well, I'm, I'm pretty demo much made. done with the stage demo. So <laughs> Yes, um, we, yeah. we don't do this live, but we have it in the demo. So um, just a brief on a uh, couple of the third-party migration tools. Now, um, this is good to know, not necessarily related to the exam directly, but uh, just for your uh, information. Third-party messaging systems, if you're migrating from them like uh, Novel, Lotus, Domino, Google, uh, IMAP is the only option that we have free from Microsoft today that you can use to migrate. May not be the best, especially if you have a large customer uh, and they require a much richer coexistence than I when they're migrating. So there are a couple of uh, third-party providers that actually 
help you do this migration uh, with uh, third-party tools, digging in partners like yourself who've made tools to help migrate and have richer experiences. From our side, uh, what's on your screen is what we can do right now. So uh, you can have uh, mail flow coexistence and global address loss sharing. That's as much as what we can do and use uh, the migration tool to bring the customer from the third-party migration into the Exchange Online system. All right, uh, that brings us uh, to a close of staged and uh, cutover migrations. Uh, we can now get into hybrid coexistence. Now, this is going to be a big, big uh, blast. We have about 10 minutes perfect for hybrid migration, uh, but would require solid focus from you guys. And now it's been quite a, a long uh, morning, but uh, if you if you want you know probably thirty seconds, just refresh yourself, have a sip of water, and we're there. All right, so I'm going to start from uh, what's there with the hybrid uh, migration process. What what are you going to have? We're talking about free busy information being shared between the on premises and online systems. Prerequisite your even if the customer is on Exchange 2003, 2007, doesn't matter. What you need to place is an Exchange 2010 CAS and Hub rule on premise to federate with the cloud services. The customer's mailbox can be at the back end in the legacy system. That's perfectly fine. Another piece, if, you're, if your customer is worried about the licensing for the Exchange 2010 box, Yes, they're going to require hardware, they're going to require a Windows license, but the Exchange license is something that Microsoft provides them to have the hybrid setup. Okay, but uh, disclaimer again, you shouldn't have mailboxes on Exchange 2010 if you're using the free license provided by Microsoft for hybrid coexistence or migration. All right, uh, that's one. So this calendar sharing mail tips is a second piece. Um, that you can have traversing between two federated organizations. And the third is the pinnacle of the user experience, which is over redirection. So you have two different OWAs, one sitting on premise, one sitting online, and uh, you can actually redirect from on premises to online and just have a single URL for all end users, no matter where they are. So they don't really need to know if they're mailbox is on-prem, online, which URL they need to use. You can just continue with their existing one and they'd automatically get redirected or prompted to click on their actual URL. So that's, that's a great uh, win in a hybrid migration. All right, uh, so just an example of GAL, a feature summary for your reference. I'm not going to dwell into that too much. All right, so getting into the planning bit. So when you're talking about hybrid migration, there's much more uh, on-premise that you need to set up than uh, just the online uh, migration tool that you need to run and Outlook Anywhere that you need to have on-premise. So Fulvio did an amazing job explaining ADFS, George saying, how do you deploy them, what are different topologies. So I won't go into that uh, today, but you need to have DirSync deployed in order to do a hybrid deployment, okay? ADFS is uh, optional, again, recommended, but optional. It's not mandatory for hybrid deployment. Dursync, yes. Uh, in Dursync, when you're doing a hybrid deployment, when you run the wizard, you have a, bit, a little check mark that says, enable for hybrid. That's important as it allows right back to the on-premises Active Directory from the online system. So if uh, you need to do that, just rerun the um, directory sync uh, wizard, put a check mark there, and you'll be good. So once that's done, the second piece is to set up the Exchange 2010 hub and cast box, like I was talking. Uh, once that's set up, you want to move routing and uh, OWA, or client access, to the Exchange 2010 box from your existing backend systems or legacy systems. Uh, have that connected to the cloud for sharing. Now, what do you do to actually have that connected? 
So what you need to deploy or you need to do is you need to first connect the Exchange 2010 box to federate with the online Microsoft Federation gateway. Now, a common question here is how, what is the pricing for the Microsoft Federation gateway? It's free. You just have to have an Exchange 2010 box on-premise and you configure it to federate with the Microsoft Federation gateway, which is in Microsoft data centers or in the cloud. And you can do it for free. There's, there's no charge on that. You just configure and you're good. A great tool to follow is the deployment guide. It's a PDF file and uh, that has all the resources required step by step to do this. The second tool is the deployment wizard. It's a web-based uh, tool uh, that you can uh, use based on which deployment technique you're going in for. You click on it and it'll walk you step by step as what you need to do in terms of the configurations on the exchange servers, the web config file change, the commands that you need to run, all of them are in there. If you're following that, you're good. All right. So that's the deployment piece, the tools that you have, how to deploy. The second is namespaces. So you could have two scenarios, and we've talked a little bit about this uh, when we talked about foping and routing. So you had uh, different namespaces between on-premise and cloud, and you had uh, shared namespaces between uh, um, on-premise and cloud. So two different scenarios. So at uh, all times, you're going to require to have um, an additional namespace when you're doing hybrid. So say, for example, you have a shared namespace uh, in the cloud services, you will have your on Microsoft.com um, namespace, but you don't want to use that for anything because that's going to be locked down by Dursync. Uh, what you want to do is you want to use a second uh, subdomain, maybe, of your primary SMTP address on premise and use that as a alias for users across that's going to help routing email. Right, so that's your basic routing processes. Again, one of my favorite uh, animations. So talking about split namespaces first. So you have online, different namespace, on-premise, different namespace. Routing is pretty simple. You're basically routing over the internet using the MX records. Nothing much to do here. Uh, but at the same time, what's happening is your user properties on the on-premise and online systems are going to be synced to reflect all aliases. All right. Uh, second is uh, the federation scenarios. Again, I'm going to leave this for your reference. Uh, just a repetition here. It's ADFS version two. You'll see it as RTW download. That's the version you. That's the one you want to go for. Uh, do put in the roll-up updates that are going to help you work with multiple domains in ADFS on a single server. All right, uh, so you have your standard users. So I'm not going to uh, run through the slides for this piece. I'm going to go to my live demo. This is for your reference and for your later learning purposes. So I'm just going to escape out of the presentation. Let me launch my demo right here. So at this point, I'm assuming I have Exchange Federation set up. Now, I, and I'm not uh, walking through the steps to do that, but there are two things that you can reference. One is the slide deck that I'm providing. It has a step-by-step -step walk you through. Second, there's a deployment video available Again, Jumpstart series, which is a great video, which will take you through step by step uh, to the entire process. So, highly recommend you watch that. Uh, this one is more focused on planning and understanding the deployment pieces uh, with respect to our context, which is the exam. All right, so. Assuming Federation set up, I have users synchronized to the online services, and you'll see this little sync sign that, that appear. The next step to do here is to manually assign licenses to these users. So I select a user, 
that I want to assign, click assign the licenses that I require, define the location, and I'm good. Simply click activate. All right, so I'll then have to uh, set passwords here. I have a uh, single sign and everything set up already at the back end, so it's automatically going to uh, tell me that this is a single sign on user, so password was not reset. Right, uh, so that's done. The second piece is to use the Microsoft Replication Service on the Exchange on premise to help us migrate users. Right, so you need to go into the web config file on premise and actually enable the MRS to work. So I'm going to open edit disclaimer here. Do take a backup of this file before you start editing into it. So search for MRS proxy configuration, uh, and it's going to be IS enabled equal false by default. You're going to have to set it to true. So that's going to enable MRS proxy, and it's going to allow you to use it. So I'm going to save this document. All right. And the next task is I can uh, go ahead and uh, enable mailbox migration in my federation system. So this is um, you, the organization relationship or the federation that you've created between your on-premise and online system. Uh, by default, mailbox movements between these two organizations are disabled. So you need to go out and enable this particular feature. So once that's done, I can actually move a mailbox. So the console that you're looking at right now, I have Exchange 2010 Service Pack 1 deployed. On the left side, I have uh, First section is my on-premises system. Second section, I've connected to my online Office 365 for Exchange piece. So I can go into the mailbox that I want to migrate on, on my on-premise system, select it, right-click, go to New Remote Move Request. Remember, this is a remote move request because you're moving between two different Exchange organizations. So I have my user there. I select uh, my target forest, uh, which is basically the name uh, that I gave when I connected to the online um, system using the Exchange Management Console. And I need to give the on-premise FQDN of the system. Remember, this FQDN that I'm using needs to be publicly writable. So ideally, this is the... Um, public name that I've provided for my Exchange server. Uh, so it's if uh, I were to look at the OWA link, it would be something like o office 365 uh, com slash OWA. So that's, that's the piece that I'm using. Um, I need to give in the source, use, uh, source user ID password, given the chart delivery uh, name. Now, this is the name that I added earlier into my remote domains and marked it as my online domain when I was configuring a federation. All right, so I'm going to click Next. New is going to start mailbox movement for me, and perfect. So I've kind of staged this for you to uh, work on the time piece and the interest of time. So it'll either complete or fail uh, based on what you get. If it's a fail, look at read the log. It'll tell you where the issue is or where the probable issue is. You need to troubleshoot it accordingly. Finish the migration. The next piece is uh, looking at OWA. So I'm going to ensure that my OWA link is set right for my federation property. So I'm going to set that. And uh, the user can then access OWA. So I'm going to launch OWA. You'll see I'll get uh, redirected automatically. So right now I'm using the on-premises um, URL, which is ex1.onprem.local, and the user is logging in. You'll see he get, she gets redirected automatically to the single URL that I'm using, which is onmicrosoft.com. They can add it to their favorites and click on it. It will be redirected to the online console. Put in the user ID. Since it's a single sign-on, it'll give you a pop-up. You just say sign in at Office 365, and it'll use your desktop credentials, login credentials, if you're logged into the same user and log you in or prompt you for credentials. 
select the location, and we're logged in. So that's uh, Exchange uh, 2010. We can view the free busy information as well. So let me launch Outlook right here. All right, and let's go to scheduling a meeting. Now, this is a user that's on premise. So Spencer Lowe is on premise. He's scheduling the meeting, and he's going to have a look at uh, Holy Holt, which is now migrated to the cloud. Uh, have a look at the free busy information. All right, and uh, you can share calendars. You can do all those great things. So that's uh, Hybrid and Hybrid Federation. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, the session. Informative. Again, uh, for step-by-step -step, uh, process for the deployment, refer to the slide deck that's provided. And also, uh, suggest to watch the deployment uh, piece, a video jumpstart that was recorded some time back. So these are two great resources that you can refer to. Deployment Assistant is a great tool that you want to have during planning and during the actual migration process as your checklist. So that's all for me. All right, so we went through the IMIP migration, the cutover migration, the stage migration, and finally the hybrid um, deployment. So all those four scenarios we have explained that kind of completes that mm -hmm. two-module section. Uh, we take a lunch break for an hour come back after lunch with Exchange Online Archiving. So uh, in context of security hygiene and compliance, planning for that, this will be a very important piece, again, within Exchange Online. Uh, thank you so much for staying with us, and we will see you back in one hour. All right.